Malmo calling Ottawa. Ottawa, bunker, are you there? Malmo calling Ottawa. Leilani Farah. Almost, almost. I'm the Phil- <laughs> Oh no, my God. <laughs> I wow. am, <laughs> wow. I am, I am Frederick Garten, and I'm the filmmaker. <laughs> Who are you? Are you sure about that? I I am Frederick Garten, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Parha, and I'm the advocate. So it seems like we haven't been doing this for a while because you got you're totally lost. But it's also a fresh thing. Actually, I called the bunker, but you've been out of the bunker, Leilani. So you're just back home from a, from long long trips. Felt like a long trip, that's for sure. Two weeks. Yeah. I, yeah. That used to be normal for me, and uh, two weeks seemed like a very long time. Now I went to distant lands that made it yeah. feel, I think, that much longer. But yeah, it was good to get out of the bunker. Yeah, and the last stop was Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh USA. of all places, Pittsburgh, yeah. USA. What is what is cooking in, in in Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh's an interesting place, actually. It was more interesting than even I thought before going there. Uh, you know, it's a steel town, but now doesn't have much steel industry. It's a city that used to be 700,000 people and has been drained of its people. Now it's 300,000 people. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it's a city that has a large African-American population that is dwindling. It's They are being pushed out. So then the question is, where have they gone? Yeah. And they're pushed out to the suburbs, basically, where there's no jobs, no transportation. And it's the story that we've seen a thousand times over in many different cities. Yeah, we saw it when we sh- when we shot Push and we went to to Harlem. Remember exactly, Derek. Yeah, exactly. and he was so he was so proud of living in Harlem, the the home of of Black history. And exactly. He was so sad that he couldn't afford to stay. Even he was he was employed. He was yeah. making good money. He still couldn't afford to live in Harlem. Exactly. And the disruption to attachment to culture and place is really huge. I didn't know that much about Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh is home to some of the jazz legends and is really, I mean, its its vibrancy, its culture has been based a lot in the African-American population. So then for them to be pushed out is you know to be dislocated from their culture out to the suburbs yeah so you were showing push there i wasn't but it was being shown there <laughs> uh-huh. okay <laughs> yeah the university of pittsburgh so so the whole um city of pittsburgh has this month called fair housing month and it's a it's a time to sort of concentrate on housing and justice and racial justice and non-discrimination. And so as part of it, sort of to kick it off, the University of Pittsburgh showed your film, our film, Push. It was very interesting for them. I mean, they're in a place right at the I think they still have an opportunity to keep the worst from happening. It's not the big private equity firms, et cetera, haven't rushed in. Uh, And so the film was, could act as a kind of alarm bell, right? And, and hopefully the advocates in Pittsburgh will be able to use the film and what we generated last week, the energy to start challenging in a major way what's going on there. But they have a new mayor who's progressive and um, he already has started to sit down with some of these big developers and negotiate with them and try to get them to ensure they're building affordable units and that kind of thing. So there's hope in Pittsburgh. That's cool. I mean, I, I was, as you know, I was in Mexico to where, where Push was now released theatrically three years later. Yeah. And I didn't have so big hopes, uh, but boom. So much attention. I was in TV shows. I was in radio shows and all the newspapers. And and you and I we wrote an op-ed in the Washington right. Washington Post uh, Spanish edition. I mean, I met the editor, and they had it was like a very high number of of, of reads on that. So they were oh, really great. happy. And a lot of audiences are coming out to watch the film all over Mexico. The film is. Still playing in many major cities, but it's also touring the country right now. I just got a 
no tear of screening in Baja California, but also in Zacatecas and many other cities. So Fantastic. It's, it's, it is really cool. And the film is unfortunately extremely timely in Mexico. Yeah. So it's a... Uh, totally fits into something that everybody is talking about because it is like an other earthquake what is happening in Mexico now in on the housing scene people in are, what people way are in, people are in shock well prices are going up and it's a lot of speculation all the things we've seen in other places there are people leaving uh, homes than empty right. and of course there is a big uh, touristification factor exactly. not not only Mexico City also in other cities yeah. So people are in shock, but it's the film totally fits into a political debate, and mm. and uh, and a lot of journalists really could see that also. So it's it's been it was really interesting, and now it's five weeks later, the, the film is still you know people are still coming out to see it. So That's it, it's fantastic. Cool. So let's hope we can do something the same in in the U.S. Exactly. Now when the country opens up again. Yeah. I actually got got um, um, an email now from from people in California who want to organize several screenings around uh, California. Ah, that's fantastic. I mean, there's no doubt that the U.S. is ripe for this. You know, the biggest activity, really, the real drive around private equity, et cetera, is happening in the U.S., especially since the pandemic. And it's just happening. No, everyone's turning their head. All the politicians seem to be just turning their head and not doing anything about it. So maybe the film can start galvanizing it, especially at local level, because I think that's where we'll get and see so much energy in, you know, in the cities. And then that can um, move up to the state and national level. It, it is a cool thing that the film, wherever it's shown, starts to create a, a local debate. Exactly. And people exactly. start to look around in their own city. It's and That's what we want, of course. And so it's... It's really cool. Yeah. But, I mean, I remember in the film, um, or when we met Saskia Sassen, the amazing sociologist, and she in some way compared what's happening on the housing market as a new land grab. Mm. It's like this, you know, the big money, the, the powerful, they take from the poor <laughs> to become even richer. And this is like, of course, it's that's something we've seen in the world history for ages, for centuries. Uh, and I mean, this is in one way what is happening also in Ukraine now. It's the yep. urge for more land or to, to steal others' land. Um, but you've been to Palestine. <laughs> I was in Palestine. Which is also a land conflict in many ways. So... Why are you going to Palestine, Leilani? Yeah. Why was I in Palestine? And a few people said to me that they prefer to call it the occupied Palestinian territories and not refer to Palestine because there really is no Palestinian state, which I thought was interesting. Um, why was I there? I mean, you know, Frederick, I keep saying I was there to make the impossible possible, <laughs> which is, you know, anytime you engage in Palestine and trying to defend the rights of Palestinians, it feels like doing the impossible um, or making, trying to make possible the impossible. Uh, I was there at the invitation of the Norwegian Refugee Council, which is the largest uh, refugee organization next to the UN, the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees. So it's a very big organization with a lot of presence in the occupied Palestinian territories and a lot of political clout. And they wanted me to look at what's called very unromantically Area C. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the nicest name, but um, after 1994 and those Oslo Accords people will have heard of, uh, which tried to create some kind of a peace to the situation, um, the occupied Palestinian territories were divided up into area A, B, and C. Area A is where the Palestinian Authority has control, and that's like Ramallah. Most people will have heard of the town of Ramallah. That's in area A. Area B is sort of joint control between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli military. And then area C, not talked about, very little is known about area C, but it is the largest area of the occupied Palestinian territories, 60% of the land, and it is completely under the control of the Israeli military. 
And it is what people don't know is it's very resource rich. It's where the best lands are. It's it's where you can grow almonds and olives and strawberries and other fruits. And um, it's where the, the shepherds are, not just the Bedouin, but the shepherds like goat herders, um, et cetera. And of course, from goats come many uh, beautiful things like yogurt and uh, what they call Lebna. So, so it's a very important and strategic area. It was supposed to be under Palestinian control a few years after Oslo. That's what Oslo says. There was no time given, but it was supposed to be a few years. Israel now claims it as their sovereign territory, but there are many Palestinians living there. The exact number not known because it's difficult to do these counts and uh, that's a demographics is a political game as well. Um, but maybe 300,000 Palestinians living in that area, uh, in villages. So it's not these main towns that we all know of. It's the, these smaller villages. And I went to a whole bunch of these smaller villages in the middle of the desert and the Jordan Valley and the Hebron Hills. Amazing. Mm. So I know you in your family has roots from Palestine and Lebanon. It must have been quite emotional. It was in ways I hadn't anticipated, to be honest. Uh, first of all, so the last two years of the pandemic, I've been spending a lot of time with my father. He lives down the road from me. And he's been talking to me a lot about his lands in southern Lebanon that also were in what's now northern Israel. He he and his family were agriculturalists, and they owned these lands, and they leased the lands and grew things, almonds, for example. Um, and when I was in Area C, I could really feel my father there. It was amazing to me. I hadn't anticipated that. He had described so much the hills and the land and the terrain and the flowers, and, and there I was in spring. And I could just see that he is of that land and the land is in him. It was really beautiful, actually. That was probably the most beautiful thing on the emotional front, actually. I don't always feel super connected to my father, um, but that really made me feel like, oh, I, I get this man now. Finally, he is a, he is a man without his lands. Yeah, yeah. pretty and, cool. But I and remember you told me once that your parents decided that you and your sister should not speak Arabic? You should be 100% Canadian. Yeah. I mean, I and don't know if it was a conscious decision, but it certainly is. Is I mean, I think for my mom, I was thinking about this recently. She's also, she's of Lebanese descent, born in Canada. I don't think that she was celebrating being Arab Canadian as a young person because she experienced and her family experienced so much discrimination. And so if you're not proud of your culture and your heritage, you're not going to pass that on to your children. And I think there was this sense um, between my parents that that um, that we should, you know, have the best education and be very Canadian and um, assimilate, basically. So there you you uh, arrive in Palestine as an Arab Canadian, not speaking a single word <laughs> Arabic. <laughs> So what I, I speak a single word. <laughs> oh, okay, so shukram. Yeah, yeah. marhaba, yeah. <laughs> kif sacha. Yeah. So how what happens? What happens with you? Uh, Can you use this in your in your relation to people there? Or? Sure. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing. So when I'm there. I'm looking at the people and I can see visually. It was a very visual experience for me. I will say that to begin with. But I can see in the bone structure and the faces of Palestinians myself. I can see it. I can see that I don't I have that kind of bone structure. But when they're looking at me, they see my hair, my teeth, my clothing, and they don't see the Arab in me. And so when I would tell people, actually, I'm 100% Arab, both of my parents are Arab, you know, there would be some kind of shock. <laughs> like, really? And then because I don't speak Arabic, it's like even more unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, but then once they realize, and especially um, that my father's family is from Marjayoun and that their, their lands were in what's now northern Israel, um, then there's this connection and something else happens. One of the other emotional things I will say is that one of my hosts, an amazing 
amazing international human rights lawyer from Israel, had previously been working with the uh, Israeli military and had been stationed in southern Lebanon in my father's town, Marjayun. Yeah. And uh, he was training the South Lebanese army, which, I mean, some listeners may, may or may not know, the South Lebanese army was very much against the Palestinians, right, fighting against the Palestinians. And um, would have that was not my family. My family was um, not um, against the Palestinians. And so complicated to have as my host this incredible fellow. I was also actually down there in 1992 as a reporter. You're kidding. When the, the Syrians entered Lebanon yeah, and together right. with the Lebanese army kicked out the Palestinians from the south. So I actually kind of entered uh, Exactly. Not with the army, but at the same time, I was yeah. in. in I, mean, I was in the big refugee camping, Onion Hillway, and then I went further in towards your father's ground. It was yeah. a lot of shelling, and it was it was very tense. Yeah. And the team I was working with, because I was doing a TV story, right? The team, the team told me, Frederick, stay on that wall, you know. Right. So we we do the shooting. You stay, you know. <laughs> oh my so god! So I was sitting. I was sitting there. Uh, and there was a lot of shelling and out from the house comes a lady with a big tray with tea. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. You know? So it was like all this hell going on. Yeah. And then she, she gave me tea and that's, I mean, for, it's a very sweet memory, which always reminds me that if you want to tell a story from war, you should always tell stories about the people yeah, who the are people. there, not, I mean, not so much about the, the warriors and the fightings. It's yeah. like, yeah, it's, um, I agree. That's an amazing story. And tea is so, yeah. so much part of the culture. And, and I agree with you about the people. I actually am putting on Instagram a series of uh, little stories about just some of the people I met, um, because like you, that's, that's where your heart gets moved yeah, but I think it's, there is a power in humanity in the sense that we all want to go back to normality yeah. as soon as possible, and a, even in the midst of of a war. Yeah. So I'm when I now read stories and hear stories from Ukraine, it's like those are these kind of the human interactions between people in in very harsh situations are still when they show humanity, it's it's very hopeful. Yeah, even if there is a lot of despair uh, happening around us. That's right. Well, and I mean, I think that's, frankly, I think that's part of why I was there was to examine and research, like, how are the Palestinians living in this area C under Israeli military control? And how can the international community help them to actually survive, but survive in that daily way? survive so that they have schools for their kids and health clinics and they can till the land and, you know, grow things and sustain themselves. And it's funny that the struggle, not funny, but it, that is where the, the struggle is at that level, right? How can the Palestinians maintain themselves in an area under heavy military occupation? You know, if a family is growing, let's say a baby is born, there's now three young children and they're living in one room. If if the Palestinians in Area C build, build, I mean, put up a tent for those children to sleep in, the Israeli military is surveying. They know when things go up and they will demolish it. If they put a rain barrel out to collect rainwaters just so that they can grow their crops in a sustainable way, the rainwater barrel will be seized uh, if they, th th I went on this road, oh my God, I was in this truck in this, you know, van that we traveled in and we're on this road and it's like so bumpy. It's like through the mountains and desert and we're being shaken and jostled all around. Julieta was with me. I should have said that. And, uh, you know, we're just being jostled and we were told that that road used to be paved, but the Israeli military, every time they, the Palestinians pave it, the Israeli military will rip it up so that they can't have a paved road from village to village. And Israel's actions in the area, uh, seizing land, building settlements, demolishing 
anything that the Palestinians build and displacing the Palestinian population are all considered violations of international law and really are violations of what an occupational force is permitted to do. So the question before me was, you know, how to encourage the international community to because the Palestinians won't be able to address this on their own. Of course not. I mean, these are sh- herders. They're shepherds. Mm. So, of course, they need to mobilize and they need to assert what they want and their voices need to be heard. But the international community needs to back them up. But the international community doesn't want to offend Israel. And that's their position. And the international community right now, they are busy with Russia's aggression against Ukraine, which is yeah. totally understandable. Yes, um, very. But I, I, as I'm also a consumer of news, I can mm. see that Israel in some kind of are grabbing more land, cutting down more trees, taking right. more apartments. Yeah. So it's like in some way using the, that the attention is somewhere else. I think that's probably right. And um, I do hope that the international community, I don't know what you think about this, Frederick, but I mean, we're not very good at learning lessons, I suppose. But, you know, what ha- what's happening in Ukraine and to Ukrainians uh, is just obviously so horrific. But it, But surely Israel and Palestine represents what occupation looks like 60 odd years down the road. And it looks pretty bleak, I can tell you that, especially for the Palestinians. And the equivalent to the Palestinians are the Ukrainians. And I just hope the international community can at least see that and try to prevent that from really happening to Ukraine. I don't know. It doesn't seem like we learn lessons, though. I don't know. I th- <laughs> What can I say? I mean, mm. I, you, may, you might be right. Mm. I think we try to uh, to learn lessons, but the thing is that what Israel has shown the world is that the reality on the ground, in the end, becomes the new reality. And I mean, that to Russia when they took Crimea, it's the same. I mean, suddenly it is Russia, you know. Absolutely. And now when Ukraine is fighting to defend themselves, they, they are not they're not even talking about Crimea because it's like it's it's too far away. That's it's, right. They can't win it anymore. Yeah. Um and I don't know, not even with uh, what they want to have NATO coming in and bombarding, you know, or closing the airspace or whatever, even then it would be hard to to take back. Crimea. So it is, it's tricky, of course. You're totally right. The facts Mm. on the ground determine the future. And Mm. I will say, uh, I can't speak about Russia because I've not been to that part of the world, but I can say that Israel, the government of Israel is masterful at creating facts on the ground to their advantage. Mm. And it's, I mean, it's, we can get into this later maybe, but this is why people cry apartheid. But Israel, not just, they use all the laws, all the planning tools, and the ability to build on the ground and create facts on the ground to their advantage to prop up the state of Israel. And in Area C, it's pretty phenomenal. Like you're in the middle of, you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, right? Like desert It's beautiful, like these beautiful desert mountains and uh, lush too, because it was spring. And then you see, you know, on the horizon, on every hilltop, an Israeli settlement or an outpost, which is like uh, not formally built, but it's like container, container homes. And that's the facts on the ground. And the people in the outposts, who live there, the the Israeli settlers who live there are some of the most um, strongly in support of the state of Israel. And that's why they're willing to live on this mountaintop and, def- and create facts on the ground as if it's their land. Israel claims Area C is sovereign, as I said, I think. Mm. Um, and I, I actually had the opportunity for the first time to visit uh, one of the Israeli settlements in Area C, a proper settlement. And, you know, it's hard to imagine dismantling that. What is it? It's like, it's, I, one would never say to dismantle it, right? So it's a whole bunch of 
pretty nice homes, shopping malls, movie theaters, tennis courts, swimming so you pools. Went in, you went in. You went in there. I yeah. did. Yeah. 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 And um, and I'm glad I did actually because I'd not i not seen that before. It gives you a different sense. It's like okay, so if Area C is to be actually given back to the Palestinians as it should under international law, what would you do with these settlements and the people living there, right? It it will result in a huge displacement of Israelis, first of all, and that's something that has to be thought about. And then would you just destroy all of these? That's not good for the environment. Couldn't they live together? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, a two-state solution a one state solution it all requires a kind of living together um but i don't know if they can live side by side house by house i uh, that's probably for them to decide i w- i wish that will be possible but you know i'm just a naive swede <laughs> <laughs> so, well look at what's so, happening right yeah. now i mean i left just at the beginning of uh ramadan And now you see there's so much violence right now. Uh, yesterday, I think four Palestinians were killed. Uh, a, a mother, a single mother of six children. I mean, these stories, this is not, doesn't bode well. And, right? then, and then you see young men, Palestinians with guns coming in and, and killing just randomly In Israel. Israel, absolutely. That and happened, I, in fact, while I was there. Yeah, and I was I was thinking of of you when I saw it because it's. I mean, I've I think it's horrible. Absolutely. And I, it's like the hardliners they nurture each other on both sides. Ab- so, absolutely. So your job and the world's job is, of course, is strengthen the people, the forces who want to find a peaceful solution. That's right. So how do we how do we give more power to the people who mm. want? A, f- a better world, you know, better yeah. A coexistence. Yeah. Well, one of the things, I mean, I'm lucky in a way. I don't have in the project I'm doing uh, in Area C. I don't have to answer all the those big big questions. But I wonder if the work that that I'm doing with the um, Norwegian Refugee Council couldn't focus a little bit more, focus atten- uh, excuse me, attention and political light on just enabling Palestinians who are working the land, living on the land with the possibility of staying on the land and developing, having normal human development, you know? And I, I like, I think what that would mean is giving some voice to Palestinians because right now they're the recipients of, of dribs and drabs of donor aid. You don't hear from them in this area at all. Um, they do not have a voice in terms of planning. They can't plan their own communities. They try, uh, but they are really just shut down by um, the Israeli um, military court. So there's a planning authority. And so if we could just empower Palestinians to say, this is what I want my village to look like now and in five years. That to me feels more hopeful and it, it it's more positive, right? And it's it's very um it's it's not those big, big questions. It's just about human survival and and doing some good. I don't know. No, I, I think you're right. I think whenever we as a community can make things a little bit better, there mm-hmm. is hope. And yeah. and I think hope is really important because the opposite of hope is cynicism and pets pessimism, which is like always the fascists' best friends. You know, yeah. when there is when there is no hope, there is rage or, uh, yeah, let's give the shit about everything. You know, I mean, <laughs> and you know it's kind of in a very yeah. horrible it's in a horrible way. Yeah, I mean, uh, and you can see in Palestine that people either kill themselves or kill others or, you know, and. But then there's a lot of people who just try to, to do, to to, to you know to protect their their lands mm. and their 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 um, crops. Yeah, I mean, what one of the things I sort of just this morning I had this thought, which is as I think about the Palestinians I met in Area C, and I mean they're literally they are agriculturalists and herders. 
what they're doing in this day and age, in an age where our planet is suffering and dying, really, and, and so many horrible things happening around climate change, they are living in a sustainable way. And what they're doing with the land is not exploitive. You know, it's really, it's the old style farming, you know, you see where these steps are put in and irrigation happens naturally. And, and the Israeli occupation is actually very much against the climate. They put in these big towers for you know surveillance telecommunication towers. They they erect settlements. We know building contributes. It's a huge. It's forty percent of uh, of CO two emissions is building construction. Um, you know there's. And of course, they're using the land. Why Why they want the Palestinians off the land, they say, is so that they can engage in more military exercises in those land. Well, that's not good for the planet. So I was thinking, you know, there's this whole ecological side to this that people don't talk about. Um, and I'll just say one other thing that is a little less optimistic. War, war is bad for climate. I mean, war is bad for climate. It yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't talk about that. I mean, we should I be talking about again. that. War is bad for climate. And it doesn't matter Thank if you. it's Putin or if it's George Bush or if it's Obama yeah. or whoever yeah. is running the wars. Yeah, it's bad for the climate. And yeah. one of the things that worries me, Frederick, about the situation in Area C, and this might be the last thing I say about it, but uh, is there are some inherent contradictions. And and this is where my my job is very complicated because... I mean, I'm really trying to get the the international community engaged in this area, Area C, in a, in a more meaningful way. There's already donor states there. So like the EU is there and the member states of the EU, of the European Union. Um, the UK is there, the US. Um, and no one I met thinks what's happening to the Palestinians in Area C is cool. Everyone was like, this is horrible. They, they can't even develop normal villages and plan for the future. And they all know that Palestinian statehood requires this area because it's so resource rich, that there will be no Palestinian state. Even the, the folks in Ramallah, they need Area C to survive economically. And yet they say, we, you know, we as the EU and member states, we, it's too risky to actually allow the Palestinians and enable the Palestinians to take over that land and have that land in a real way. Mm. So that's a kind of depressing bit here. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, I again, remember that you said that your parents actually didn't want you to be activist around the Palestinian issue because you will then carry bitterness with you mm. your whole life. Heartache. So, mm -hmm. Heartache. Yeah. The Palestinian heartache. Are you? Is that getting to you now? I think I've learned to live with that. the The dual feeling of heartache and um, advocacy and and justice and human rights will win. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a fighter in that way, um, fighting with human rights. So, of course, sure. I carry sadness with me. And and to see the occupation. So, the last time I was there was 20 years ago. And to see the occupation now, 20 years since, it's so um, in every structure and, and it, it's very institutionalized. Uh, and that's much harder to dismantle, in my opinion, when it's not so, it is visible, but it's not as visible or something. I, I don't know how to describe it. How do you take down the wall? There's a wall, as people know, that separates areas and how you know these checkpoints now they're just the checkpoints are like going through a toll booth if you have the right license plate uh if you're palestinian it's a different story if from the west bank but i don't know it, it it's very complicated now it's so enmeshed in the everyday mm. every light every light every light bulb seems to have a purpose you know of yeah. occupation yeah. Leilani, if people want to know more about your mission there, can they read it, read about it somewhere? Not yet. Um, they can look at my Instagram post, but <laughs> besides that, um, we'll be writing a report and uh, it will be forthcoming in September, I think. So, um, Is this on the shift, uh, make the shift org? Not yet. Uh, we haven't put anything up uh, and we probably won't um, until uh, September when everything is moving forward. And then we'll start using it to all work with the Net Norwegian Refugee Council to uh, move it forward in political circles. So stay tuned. I'm, I'm happy to be your friend, Leilani, and that you're out there 
trying to do cool stuff. And I think trying is extremely important. Mm. Uh, we all need to keep trying, even if it's there is a feeling of heartache and <laughs> of maybe this is like too big of a task. But but keep trying. It's Thanks, cool. Frederick. Thanks, I, Frederick. Hey, I, uh, hey, can, can we get a little update? I think you were in Copenhagen. Let's move on to happy times, maybe. What were you doing in <laughs> Copenhagen? What was happening there for you? Copenhagen is hosting one of the best documentary film festival in the world. It's called CPH Docs. CPHDocs.dk. And that's the place where we uh, we premiered Push three years ago. Yes. Um, but in our documentary film world, we also need to find uh, money to make our films. Mm. So they also have what they call a financing forum. So it may make bas basically a meeting spot where you meet funders. And the funders are like from the, the platforms, Netflix and others, to the more traditional... Uh, public broadcasters and the the theatrical distributors, the sales agents, the some funds with money and so on. So there's a lot of people meeting up, and if you're lucky, your your product can be selected. So we we pitched. It's called pitched. You present, you present the project. You get like seven minutes to present your project. Oh my god! And there seven is minutes. Like wow. Seven minutes. There is like an audience of two hundred people in the room. And then there's a little panel that also have seven minutes to ask you some questions. And then there was three days of meetings. So we like, we had meetings from, you know, back to back half an hour meetings with, you know, from, you know, from Netflix to German TV channels to Dutch uh, to, uh. Yeah. and then after that, we also had more meetings online because there was a lot of people who still not oh, right. fine, of course, yeah, who were, could, watch this online and then they all could also book meetings with us. So we've also been with a lot of uh, meetings with American founders. So I basically, I was presenting a new film project. Right. And so, was it stressful or fun or both? <laughs> uh, you know, my challenge is always, do people at all understand what I'm up to? You know, yeah. <laughs> because I had the same feeling when I was presenting push that people, ah, they don't really get what I'm up for. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they mm -hmm. think, oh, this is, you know, it sounds like very current affairs, uh, traditional journalism, and then it's not. So not it's, at all, yeah. No, so and and with this new product, I have the same challenge. So, right. but I, I I got a lot of a lot of, especially my colleagues, the people who don't have money, they were really supportive. Great. In that, in some way, that also gives a lot of energy. Absolutely. When you feel that your colleagues, at least. Yeah. Yeah. You need your people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, and then, of course, uh, there was also, we had a lot of positive meetings with funders. Good. Um, but everybody has to go home to their own buildings and groups and have meetings yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And then they will right. put all the different, so, you know, where they're going to put their money. So it's right. it's long, long journeys. But it's, I'm on it. And then one day I will also tell you and, and the listeners of this, if you follow Pushback Talks, I will... I will at one point start to introduce uh, stories from this new film. Excellent. Coming up, but it will not, I mean, the film is not coming up this year, so I'm not really ready to talk right. big time because it doesn't really help me. I ha In some way, I need to keep my creative process a little bit closer to myself before yeah. I start to talk too much about it it's yep. because it's in some way it takes also away energy from me. I totally understand. I remember that with push, you yeah. kept it pretty close. Uh, yeah, it's it to makes sense the, to me. Keep the energy where it should be, mm -hmm. and to uh, to you know to brag around about the product that you know there is such. A, you know, I sometimes I describe making documentary films as like it's a it's not a marathon, it's a double marathon. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, you. <laughs> You arrive, you're, oh, the goal is coming up. And then when you arrive to goal, somebody tells you, okay, one more round. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so I don't know how many laps I still have to go. There is mm. for sure quite a, quite a few. And, mm. and, and funding is one of them, you know. So oh, yes. Uh, that is something we share. 
<laughs> this is uh, a film like Push. It's still around like one million dollars, you know. So it's right. It it is real money, and yeah. even if you think Sweden is a wealthy country, we can get maybe thirty percent of our funding from here. Right. So the rest we have to find. Um, through co-productions or uh, pre-sales of TV rights and, mm. uh, and grants. And, and of course, also from, from our audience, because That's we normally right. do like uh, uh, crowdfunding campaigns and we will probably do that again. So we will ask you to help out one more time. I'm Leilani. here. I'm here. <laughs> and you know, mom. I am. <laughs> I'm a big supporter of your work, Frederick. That's cool. I'm sure it's going to be great. That's cool. So we have been talking a lot about Pittsburgh, Palestine, Mexico, Copenhagen. Amazing. And uh, there's a I'm world in, out there. And you're in <laughs> Ottawa and I'm in Malmo and the sun is shining on both places. It's like, yep. wow, it's not bad. Yeah, the world's okay right now. Yeah. Yeah. So my dear, um, we should soon connect again. Uh, there's a lot of stories we want to follow up what's, what's happening. Yes. I'm really curious about what's going on in Berlin, for yeah, example, after this, after this, after this referendum. Yeah. Because they won big time. What what is happening now? So that might be the next thing we should look into. I'd like that. But for now, hasta la vista, hasta luego. See you later, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Pushback Talks is produced by WG Film. To support the podcast, become a patron by going to patreon.com slash pushbacktalks or follow us on social media at make underscore the shift and push underscore the film.